just want to say briefly that it's quite strange to me for reading at the Town Hall Tavern, because uh, in the late 1950s, uh, the Town Hall Tavern was the Manchester Poets Pub. Uh, I was just a, I was a mere schoolboy from Stockport at the time, but it was here uh, in this pub that I first met some real adult poets. Um, they called themselves the Peter Lou Group. Uh, we don't seem to hear much about them these days. They also call themselves Mavericks. Uh, now people like, I remember Tony Connor, Robin Skelton, Hugh Massingham, um, Alan Chambers, quite a variety of people. Jack Marriott, I don't know what's happened to most of them. Now. But, uh, so that's curious. And um, I think one of the upstairs rooms, this one or the one at the back, was known as the Poet's Room. And I think it said it on the door. It doesn't seem to say it anymore. <laughs> no. I don't think they did readings, because we didn't mess around with that sort of thing in those days. They just used to come here and drink and talk. <laughs> well, we still do that as well. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Lancashire graveyards. Gridstone slabs invaded by black lichen and forgotten names. Rain in the wind, the tops in cloud. Is labour also buried here, singing in the ground, the day will come? We no longer have the means of conducting a life in such surety. But we can still dance, proudly behind the facades, our boots clang all night. And the more we dance, the more we think of a society not run on mutual deceit. Many have led such a thought through their lives, but later died, and the thinking had to begin all over. And it does. It truly does. Generation after generation in ever deeper colours, pushing pushchairs up steep hills and writing theses on participation. The real thinking continues in the practice of future, the art of precisely here and how to maintain hope while the world leans into its empire of failure, leaving us free to die at last. Bury us here, where labour is buried, under the dark sod, and set up inscriptions on gridstone slabs in memory of our great persistence and optimism. This poem is called Immigrant. Driving the long road at night in the rain, rain so hard I can hardly see the road, looking for something, Highway 13, looking for a family, a contract, a green gauge tree heavy with fruit, a lost child. Rain comes down so hard, windscreen can't take the rain. Driving through the night, rain beating on the car's roof, moving out, heading for another city, another cheap outskirts, looking for a job. Rain, rain, never stop. And I remember walking the thin path through the meadow grass to visit my sweetheart's house. Darkness of fate descending slowly on me, taking steps in the right direction. And the sky could have done anything that fine darkness of the soul from which no one needs rescuing. This poem is a sort of summary of a train journey from Liverpool to Hendon Bridge. It's called 539 from 9th Street. <coughs> the vast flat lands between Liverpool and Manchester sliding into sunset people of short stature reading about stars. After Rochdale, the street lights rise into the sky, and we, side by side through the darkness, we stayed together in our woolly hats. We get out at a 19th century station, 50 yards of wooded darkness and the rustling river leads us home. Our lives are coastal sand. My scheme is to, is to spend 10 minutes reading fairly recent and quite sort of serious, you might say, poems of one kind and another. 
and then ten minutes reading, uh, well, also serious but uh, less poetical pieces. Um, Yes, here we are. I'm going to read four 12 line, line poems I've recently written. I think uh, it's a stanza 25 at the moment, it's a set of 12 line poems which I call myself in one. Buff and ready, not sonnets. Willful impoverishment, O oh, evening star, how will you guide us past that? How do we meet hands over the hilltops when both of us are vapour? Your work is to hold the sky together, mine to hand in a letter of complaint to the town hall. But your reach is wider, covering the dome from east to west. And thus sang the old man, O night, O book, O star in the water, listen. There's a man in the streets of Leeds in the rain in the big Christmas crowds, singing into a microphone, take my whole life too. We should we all recognise this course as being, um, who, who did that first? I know it is a UB40. It was Elvis Presley, wasn't it? Was it? I think so. Yeah. It can't help falling, can't help falling in love with you. Yeah. 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 Yes. Here's a curious one. Jeremy Prenn, I wish I could play the arch lute to your physical ear. And we would walk together over the dark moorlands, believing in something, I don't know what. Some call, some night music of stop and start, some tremble between beliefs. There are many I walk with. I walk with Wordsworth and with Shakespeare, who constantly disappears, and Hardy, guide and spokesman. Sometimes hundreds of us walk the tired, dark page, water with stars in it licking into our boots, eradicating belief, but a crowd worth joining, not a protest, a recognition of earth in the moon's clearing. The final recapture of the world to end on an open fifth like a forest path ending in a prospect of small towns distributed across the agricultural plain, which seems to say that all is well enough, as far as we know, or everything worth knowing about is under permanent threat. Sometimes at night, alone on the open moors, every condition of death surrounds and tramps about me. Deaths of everyone I knew when young, anti this, uncle that, no trace now, but still the face smiling up at me and fading into the dark hills they never knew with a wish for a child's success. At the end of this walk, maybe a pub or bed to rest my head, aching with world. Ending at an open space, a whole dome of sky bonded over us and the star of the sea washed up on an earthen bank as the question about poverty and exploitation shining in the darkness. Will anyone ever answer? In the winter 1213, I became, very suddenly, an old man. The voices on the night moor are stones in a wall rained on until the water reaches the footing and flees to the town. Until society and economy are brought to support each other until the trees fall into the river, until the stones weep, there are badly swollen people among us. Frank Cassidy, who was an Irish fiddle player. 
I can't play properly now. Never could, really. Slow, subdued Irish speech. And immediately broke into a bonny Kate that would raise every hair of a bold man's head, followed by the blackbird, at which the soul lies face down on the green slopes of earth, hoping for political good into the dawn. Which comes bright or failed, leavers itself onto the hill wrapped in thin rain, and those of us who are blackbirds will whistle and sing to it, and like all good workers, pass on to unmarked graves for the sake of the good that goes unacknowledged and builds piecemeal a future with enough cracks in it to evade political determination. And I did nothing else, and everything I did was done by these barren shores where the grey rock breaks at the sea's edge, milled into the dawn. It was the only thing I could do. The rest was shift. I, and I did it all for Bonnie Kate, who was lost to us by politics. But I followed her ship into a pack of golden leaf. Um, now type two. Um, I do things that I call pieces because I don't want to call them poems. They're mostly in prose and they're very short. And they're, kind of, they're, they're, they're sort of casual. Some are just anecdotes, some are stray remarks, uh, some are quoted from other people. And uh, they come from all sorts of periods in my life. Some of them go back a long way. And that involves places known known to you here since I came from this part of the world. <coughs> Holston Field, 1995. In Dovedale, a Helen swoops into the updraft and sails away. In the dining room at the George Inn, it's very busy. There's a family here from one of the campsites who find they haven't got enough money for a meal and are embarrassed. And the landlady says, it's all right. If you can't pay, you can't. Order what you want and send a check later if you can. This should be the act of an entire economy. I don't just come here for a scenery. I walk back to my lodgings through Virtuoso Belding. Floating verse. Something very small happened. It was August the 5th, and I went to Brick Fair. Nothing much happened, but I ended saying that the green leaves would wither and the branches die before I proved false. And that was about a quarter of what I meant. Park Lane, Stockport. Excuse me, I sit down. The embanked wall against the wasteland, the path through the grass to the outdoor toilet, the rickety wooden stairs up to the first floor back bedroom where my mother nearly died of rheumatic fever in about 1925. I come here to sleep in a wallpapered room with one small window. A spider's sleep a sleep of dandelion clocks and cloud. A nightlight standing in a saucer of water on an old wooden dresser. A steady candle flame in a small window, visible far across the wreck. Help Maritime. These things dart all over the world. It doesn't mean I'm a great traveller, it just means I sometimes have a holiday. Um, the wine was dark at Hotel Terminus. White ghost of a house across the road and a small falcon hovering over its garden with one carnation. The facade pitted like weathered limestone. We ate sandwiches in dim light with the balcony window open an island in a river of strategies for the future swirling round us, small businesses, youth, 
piping is in the night. Sometimes the future is somebody else's future. The stretching heights above us were a darkness, a past, nobody's. On the rock surfaces of the highest pastures have inscribed ancient cosmic fantasies and desperate love yearning by 17th century shepherds catching floating verses from the bitter air. In our hotel room, in our cheap cocoon, we scratched a necessary meal together from the village shop. Long-term patience resulting from long-term patience. Peter Hughes drove us up to Flascati, a cloudy evening heavy with warmth. The lights of Rome in the distance under a layer of cloud. We got porchetta sandwiches at the stalls and sat at long wooden tables with carafs of Frascati fresh from the autumn picking. Kings, I thought, made this possible. And we, not kings, made it continue. I used to look at the older men queuing in the bus shelter in Mersey Square, Stockport in the 1950s and see each one as a lecturer and imagine a subject for them. That one's chemistry, that one's history, etc. They were middle-aged workers going home. I had to ignore their clothes, but their faces offered no resistance to this exercise. Now, I dream of there not being a university. <laughs> <laughs> the knowledge we pass on to our children through eight languages and all the small bones of the left hand. Um, here it is. Poole's Cavern at Buxton. There used to be many such, scattered across the countryside and on the edges of towns. Small museums attached to tourist attractions, seaside, caves, waterfalls, crammed with almost anything considered viewable. We were ignorant and trusting about value. Stuffed birds, coins, a Peruvian mummy, old firearms, geological specimens, and for young children, a videorama who looked into a lit box through portholes and saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, who later took over the whole thing. <laughs> a boy of 12 adored it, education which was an escape from education, with glimpses into corners of the world which no one would ever be able to explain. Burial urns, wooden flutes, African statuettes, horseshoes. But explanation and site-specific relevance became increasingly insistent, and anything not conforming had to go, which was everything. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves piled it all up in the yard and set fire to it. July the 18th, 1967. Michael Haslam told me last night that once he was staying in a remote French village somewhere. I don't remember which part of France, but it was miles from anywhere, a very quiet, rural place. And early one morning, there was a woman, there was a woman running down the village street, shouting over and over again, John Coltrane est mort. Screensaver. There's a wonderful moment when you've instructed the computer to close down and things start disappearing off the screen one by one until they've all gone. And for three or four seconds, the landscape, or whatever it is, something you put there because you believed in it, is there in its entirety, with no labels stuck on it, no doors in it, no tableaus waiting to be thrust in front of it. But from ground to sky, it's all there in front of you filling its space. And I think I do that one. 
Um, this one I'd like to read as quietly as possible, which none of the rest of you might not hear it at all. It's called To a Grandchild. The song says, Don't ever leave me, but I shall. I shall leave you. And so too eventually will your mother and father leave you to continue alone singing your dawn song. Thank you.